Amen, indeed. Uh, thank you, as always, to Marsha and the choir, to the Bell Choir today as well, uh, for such beautiful music here in this space. Uh, good morning again, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to greet you all on this, uh, again, lovely, lovely fall day. Had to, uh, I park in the driveway at our house, had to heat up the car for a couple of minutes to clear off the windshield for the first time this year before coming into church this morning. So, uh, we've, we've reached that point, haven't we? Uh, thank you, as always, for being in worship with us and for continuing through uh, this worship series we've been in for the last few weeks. The title of this series, again, is Questions Jesus Asked. Uh, we've uh, gone through three weeks. We're just over halfway. We've gone through three weeks. This is week four. We've got two more after this. So today's question asked by Jesus is, what really matters? Now, this is kind of a paraphrase of the questions that we actually get from Jesus in today's gospel reading in Mark. He does not ask this exact question, but this is the implied question in his words today. So today, we are going to approach this question in two ways. One, we're talking about what really matters communally, what matters in our communal, uh, uh, social, societal context, what matters to the collective body of Christ. And two, what matters personally, what matters to us individually in our personal lives. So, first, we're going to examine what matters communally, what matters to us as one body in Christ. And we are looking to Scripture for our answers today. Uh, we're actually going to be in three books today. First, we are in the prophet Amos, then we'll be in the prophet Micah, and then we will conclude with the Gospel of Mark. So the reason that we're in three books today is that we're looking at a pattern, as we're often doing. And one of the clearest patterns in Scripture, and there are many patterns, but one of the clearest ones is God's desire for life, justice, and peace among God's people. So when we read the Bible, if we are reading it carefully and if we are taking it seriously, and particularly when we read the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, we will see that humanity's understanding of the nature of God actually changes and evolves over the course of Scripture. Now, we, uh, we often struggle with this. It's a common complaint, uh, a common struggle with folks who often say, well, we don't like the nature of God in this Old Testament passage or in this particular apocalyptic passage. We don't like the version of God that's portrayed here. But the key is that it's not so much that the nature of God is changing as it is that humanity's understanding of God is evolving. It evolves, essentially, from viewing God as a God of retribution to viewing God as a God of healing and love, right? So again, it's not that the nature of God is changing from one passage to the other. It's that we are learning more about the true nature of God. God's healing love, or God's justice, as we'll call it in our scriptures, it is arguably the great storyline of the Bible. God is always seeking out people and communities that are broken in some way, victims, outcasts, sinners, doubters, so that God can heal and restore them. And again, the great contrast here, the great contrast is between God's understanding of justice and our own understanding of justice, humanity's understanding of justice. And we have all observed this in the world many, many times. We all know that this is true. In short, humans tend to seek justice through retribution and oftentimes violence, while God seeks justice through healing and forgiveness. And so, biblical justice is very different from political or cultural justice. Political justice is often akin to violence and vengeance, but biblical justice, as we will see, is akin to righteousness. 
It is about God's righteousness. So, we see this in lots of the Hebrew prophets. That's why we're going to read from two of them today. Uh, Now, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, I, I mentioned briefly how Jesus is different from the prophets who came before him, and he is different, of course, in many ways. But today, we're looking at how Jesus is similar to the prophets who came before him. Jesus is educated and grows out of this long line, this long tradition of Hebrew prophecy that comes before him. So how are they similar? Well, today we're starting in the book of Amos. Now, as prophet, Amos speaks with the voice and the authority of God. Now, I, I trust that many of you are, are, are uh, familiar with this uh, uh, sort of tradition at this point in your spiritual lives, but a reminder, a reminder, a prophet is not so much someone who predicts the future as it is someone who is communicating the desire of God to God's people, speaking with the voice of God. So prophets like Amos and Micah, they have a way of calling out the dominant cultures that surround them, and frankly, of offending lots of people while they do so. It's challenging stuff, but it's good stuff. So Amos chapter 5, 18 18 through 24 is what we're going to hear today. And in this passage, Amos is calling out those who believe themselves to be righteous. In other words, the hypocrites, as Jesus does too. The hypocrites who believe themselves to be righteous while ignoring God's desire for justice. And Amos reads, Doom to those who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. It's as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or sought refuge in a house, rested a hand against the wall, and was bitten by a snake. Isn't the day of the Lord for you darkness and not light, all dark with no brightness in it? I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies. If you bring me your entirely burned offerings and gifts of food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps. And here's the famous part. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos doesn't mince words here. Very few of the prophets do. He does not mince words. The message could not be clearer. God desires justice and righteousness. God does not desire a a glamour or wealth or any kind of faith that is performative and inauthentic and hypocritical. God wants us to take God's message seriously, right? In our ministry and in our personal lives, we need to be taking God's message seriously. And we see the same thing in Micah. Today we're hearing from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, and you've all heard this before, I trust. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before God with entirely burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? God has told you, O mortal, or human one, as the CEB says, what is good and what the Lord requires from you to do justice, to embrace faithful love or love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So, Amos and Micah, they remind us that God's justice or God's righteousness is rooted in humility, faith, and compassion. 
and never in pride or anger or violence or retribution. God's justice is restorative in contrast to humanity's pattern of judgment and violence. Now, as we said, this is something that we feel deeply. We feel this deeply in our, in our own bodies and we feel it as a collective body. We know this to be true because we see it in the world around us every day. So many of humanity's justice systems are rooted in judgment and violence and condemnation. And we're all a part of it. it we, we, we see it so much that we almost internalize it and develop bad habits through it. We tend to demand justice for everything without really knowing what it means. We want God to punish other people for their sins instead of cleansing people of them. And we have built this image of God into so many levels of our political infrastructure. So much of what we do is transactional, reactive, quid pro quo, weighed and measured. It's, it's so much about punishment and reward, good people and bad people. But the thing is, none of this actually connects us with God. None of this actually connects us with God's love or reflects God's desire for healing and forgiveness. We tend to assume that we know what everyone else deserves while giving very little thought to what everyone needs, right? It's about wants and needs, as it so often is. But God and God's prophets understand that what the world needs is restoration or restorative justice rather than retribution or vengeance. Now remember, the prophets speak with the voice of God, and they do so because they understand the heart of God. And the heart of God desires to comfort the afflicted, raise up the persecuted, and welcome the outsider. The heart of God never desires exclusion or scapegoating, but instead it desires the fullness of God's kingdom reflected in our ministry. And so, this is, this is really difficult for us. It's, it's so difficult for us to wrap our heads around it because we struggle with it every day. We see the opposite in almost every place that we look outside of the church. God's justice, it's not about us getting what we think we deserve. And it's definitely not about that person over there getting what we think they deserve. It's about God giving that person what they need and God giving us what we need. Now, to transition to Mark, most importantly, most importantly, this is demonstrated for us in the gospel itself. And so if we lose sight of the value of healing and restoration, then we lose the single most important lesson of Jesus. Because over half of his teaching and his parables has directly to do with forgiveness. It's all about forgiveness with Jesus. And the greatest act of God and Christ is, how does the gospel end? What's the greatest act of God and Christ? It's to take the crucifixion itself and turn it into the resurrection. God doesn't deal in vengeance. God deals in healing. And Jesus tells us this in Mark today, and he tells us in a, in a kind of strange way, but he's saying it by saying that life is more important than death, that God's restorative justice has the final word rather than the ways of the world. So what really matters to Jesus? He gives us these hints in Mark. We're in chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. 
but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. So, do you remember earlier when Amos said, why do you want the day of the Lord? Well, Jesus is saying the same thing. He's saying the same thing here. But they're not saying this because on that day everyone is going to be punished or raptured or raised up. They are saying this because on that day we will see that we had our priorities in the wrong place the whole time. We've had this whole thing backwards the whole time. That's what they're getting at. Jesus is asking, what do you live for? What are you going to spend your life doing? What really matters? And what really matters is life and love. Amos and Micah and Jesus, best of all, understood this. They recognized that what we need is also what everyone else needs. And this is so important for us here in the church. We never bring anyone to God. We never change anything. We never transform anything through vengeance or anger or violence or hatred. We can perpetuate lots of bad stuff. We're pretty good at that, actually. We can perpetuate lots of stuff that way. But healing and righteousness simply does not happen that way. So, that's sort of the challenging part. It's, it's this communal part, right? This societal part, this justice-oriented part. It was about what we need as a collective body of Christ. Now, the second part today, about what really matters, what we really need, is about what we need personally and in our personal lives. So for this one, I'm just going to tell a couple of brief stories. Uh, I think that we need scripture and the gospel for the communal stuff because, frankly, we're not very good at it, are we? We need scripture and the gospel for that stuff. For the personal stuff, it's nice to have stories. So the first is, is just kind of an anecdote. Uh, I was on a Zoom call recently, uh, and my ordination class was sharing about ministry practices that renewed and inspired us. And one of my colleagues told about a friend who had come back from maternity leave and had preached while holding her newborn baby. Uh, the baby napped through the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I don't remember the details. I don't remember, like, if her child care had fallen through or if it was just her way of introducing the, the baby to the congregation. But the point was, and the point is, sharing and celebrating that young life mattered more than the decorum and expectations of preaching on Sunday morning. Love mattered more than the habits of the world. And you can imagine someone doing that and having maybe a couple of folks in the back kind of grumbling and crossing their arms and maybe thinking it's not very appropriate, right? But the point is that the child mattered more than the expectations, right? And the second, uh, second story I'll tell is a personal story uh, of mine, and it's one of my favorites to tell. So almost two years ago, back in, uh, back in 22, I was sitting up on the couch in our living room with my uh, two-year-old at the time, toddler, Eliza, our youngest, and we were watching a movie together while she settled down for bedtime. Uh, Eliza and I are the night owls in our family, so this tends to happen pretty regularly, actually. And in fact, she sat up with me for a bit last night watching the Michigan-Michigan State football game together. So, so yeah, we would go blue, Wolverines. She was our good luck charm last night. So, uh, so it was Christmas time. It was December of 22. And the tree was glowing still in the corner of our living room as we were sitting together. But that night, 
I was stressed out and frustrated about something that had happened at work today, and I, I was still just kind of just kind of mulling it over, and I, I had well and truly brought work home with me that day. I was still in a bad mood. And I wish I could say that pastoral ministry never affects us in this way, but that's, that's just not the world that we're living with. So I was just, uh, I was frustrated as we were watching the movie. Now, the movie that we were watching, it was an animated adaptation of Scrooge, the old musical based on Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. We have an image of it here. Uh, maybe a, a few of our folks with uh, kids or grandkids, maybe you've seen this animated one on Netflix before. Uh, so this show, Scrooge, it's been adapted for the stage and the screen many times. The most recent version is this one here. Uh, of course, there are dozens of other non-musical and other adaptations of A Christmas Carol outside Scrooge. My personal favorite is Muppet Christmas Carol. I hope there's a few fans of that one out there too. So we're on our way uh, through all the holidays here. But there's a song... There's a song in Scrooge called Happiness. It's a duet between Scrooge and his new love interest, Isabel, uh, in which they are dancing together at Mr. Fezziwig's annual Christmas party, right? Uh, and the animated version of this scene is beautiful. It's artistic, it's abstract, the, the music is lovely, and Eliza is totally captivated by it. But meanwhile, I'm still sitting there next to her on the couch, stewing, looking at my phone, annoyed about something work-related, an email that I didn't want to receive or a text message that I didn't want to respond to. And about halfway through the song and dance, little two-year-old Eliza gets up off the couch and wordlessly takes my hands. Now, I don't really know what she wants, if she's hungry, if she's thirsty, if she needs to be changed or what. She's not talking much at this point. She's still not talking much, so I'm not quite sure what this is about. But as she pulls me up, I realize that she wants to dance with me. She wants to dance just like the characters in the movie are dancing on the screen. And so we spend the rest of the song spinning around our living room in the glow of the Christmas tree, while the, the show's duet is singing about happiness. And when it's over, a, a little Eliza says, again, that's one of the few words she knew at the time, again. So we dance to it a, a couple more times before we settle back down. Uh, I have spent all week trying to remember what was annoying me that night and I couldn't tell you. I still have no idea. I don't know what it was. It cannot have mattered as much as that little girl who just wanted to dance with her daddy. It was one of those just unforgettable moments when life itself reminds you of what God desires for us. Happiness, love, joy, serenity, life. All we really need in our lives is love. Insert Beatles reference. Right? What really matters? Well, like we said at the beginning, this question kind of has two answers. In the communal or the social or the public body of Christ context, the answer is more challenging because I believe the answer is God's restorative justice. But in the personal context, it is nothing more or less than a loving relationship with God. That is still all that God desires from us. Love and justice are about relationships, our relationships with each other, our relationship with God and how that is reflected in our relationship to the world. And healing and forgiveness, when you think about it, healing and forgiveness are really the only sustainable ministry practices we have. They're the only sustainable disciplines we have. At the end of the day, it all comes down to this. To know God in this way, to know Jesus in this way, 
to know each other in this way. It's to become part of the body of Christ, to experience the kingdom of heaven right here and right now. Thanks be to God for that, and amen.